but I'm even help doing the live coding. Fine. Yeah, so, uh, well. I still need to learn from Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to the meetup. Um, I'm going to introduce you Cosmos and what Cosmos is, what the vision behind Cosmos is, and how Cosmos fits into the current ecosystem of blockchains. It'd be great. So, if everyone could use your phones and go to this URL, um, so that you can submit questions there, because this session is quite long, and we will have breaks in the middle, where you can think about questions you might have, and then you can talk about them later on, after the entire thing is over. Um, and it's literally just enter Cosmos, and you should be able to submit questions. Yes, so today I want to talk to you about how Cosmos is the next natural evolution within the blockchain space. Recently we've come up a lot, a lot against a lot of problems, right? So we have the scalability issue with Ethereum and Bitcoin with hard fork and Bitcoin recently happening. And we have the whole issue around the fact that we're building these immense silos. We're building these stores of value which are completely isolated from everything else. It can be kind of seen, and I'll use this analogy later as well, the early days of the internet where a lot of services were isolated in their own networks and you couldn't really interoperate between the different services. And that's kind of the stage we're in right now with blockchains. But the next evolution will be that we actually have full interoperability between different services. And of course the holy grail. Okay, cool, yes. Um, this talk will be split into three different parts. Um, the first one will be a demo. The second part will be a high level overview of what Cosmos is and how it works from an architectural perspective. And the third part will be more of a deep dive into how it actually works under the hood, how you as developers can make use of it, how you can build applications on top of Cosmos. And yeah, that should be it. And then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Because I hope there will be questions. I'm actually pretty certain that there will be questions. Because there are already a lot of questions. Oh, great. Cool. <laughs> so let's get started. So that's me. I have a background in computer science and business management. Um, and this is just so to get me started, that you know a little bit about myself. I've lived in four different countries, and I'm an avid drone enthusiast, so I fly small racing drones on the weekend. By far the coolest thing I've discovered last year, besides blockchain, I think. Um, my research interests within blockchain space are very much around consensus engines and secure pack zones. So secure pack zones are all about how do you actually move value that you have in one of these silos and port it over in a secure way to another silo, or ideally not a silo at that stage. But not only the one-way pack, but rather the two-way pack. So how can I move one Bitcoin into Ethereum and one and then again from Ethereum back to Bitcoin. And with that comes also decentralized exchanges. And I think one of the more interesting things is e-voting and usability, because I wrote my master thesis on e-voting. Um, and I think the usability question of blockchains is a real problem at the moment, right? We need to get to a stage where not only technical people are able to use blockchains, but rather where the experience is so easy that even my parents or my grandparents are able to use it. Oh yeah, and I want to introduce also the team behind Cosmos. So we're roughly 10 to 15 people, and this is really out of date by now, because we're always adding more people. But yeah, this is kind of the core team that's been developing Cosmos for the last two years or so, and I've recently joined. So, demo time. Harriet, if I could help. Ask for your help to hold the microphone. Yeah, of course. So this is the first time I actually do a live demo, but it should give you kind of an overview of what what the possibilities actually are and how easy it is to get started with, especially ten, the Tenement Consensus Engine. So you should be able to, normally you should be able to, within let's say 10 minutes, be able to get your first application running. And that doesn't sound really great because, as you can see, we're going to do a very, very simple application. But you always need to remember that this application can run on tens of thousands of computers at the same time, and the core consensus engine 
can actually maintain the order of transactions. So you can have tens of thousands of users in, around the world all submitting transactions at the same time and can never run into conflicts from the application side. Uh, let's see where we are. Okay. Yeah, I've tried this before, so I'm just going to remove the old file, the files and recreate them. Okay, so we're starting from a clean slate. Uh, I've recently added the ability to install Tendermint, the core consensus engine, which we'll talk about a lot later, from Brew. So if you're on Mac, you might be familiar with Brew Package Manager. So the only two steps to actually get started with Tendermint are Brew Tap Tendermint Tendermint, which installs the formula to, and I'm not going to run this, this might take a while, if you have, because I don't have great network here. And then you go Brew Install Tendermint. And again, I can't run this because I, it takes a while to run over the Wi-Fi. There we go. But those are the only two steps to actually install Tendermint and be ready to start using it. Once we have this, we can do a very simple test. Um, we have to initialize Tendermint first, so it's a proof of stake system and you need some private key setup in the beginning to actually sign blocks um, and secure the blockchain. But once you have that, you can just say tenement node, and this then starts node, and give it a flag to test it, so we can run it with the dummy app. And right now, here we see blocks being produced and being validated by the underlying consensus engine. Of course, the dummy app doesn't actually do anything, so this is just a test to see if it works. But now we'll go into something more interesting. Uh, let me pull up Emacs. So what we'll also talk about later is how Tendermint, the Tendermint consensus engine, abstracts away the business logic. When you think about how Bitcoin is, uh, was developed, it's a very monolithic application. Everything is in one, so you have the peer-to-peer -peer consensus layer, the uh, peer-to-peer -peer layer on how to connect to other Bitcoin nodes, you have the consensus layer of how the proof of work is implemented. And at the, on top of all of this, you have the application logic, the UGXO model. What Tenorin does, it takes the peer-to-peer -peer layer and the consensus layer and puts that into its own code base. And the application logic is completely separate. It's actually the way those two interface is over a socket connection. So it opens up a socket connection and then transmits transactions from Tenorin consensus to the application. And again, I'll go into more details later. Um, so, now let's program the actual application, the example application. And I'm going to cheat here and just insert a snippet because I didn't want to do that kind of risky live coding. And I'm just going to quickly walk you through what this actually is. This is a basic struct which just holds some state. And this is not, this is ephemeral state, so once we restart the application, it goes away. If you program like Ethereum like this, you would um, you'd want to use some sort of online database to persist the state. And then these messages are essentially what the application logic needs to implement. So it know, needs to know how to respond to, once it receives an info message, it needs to know how to respond to the response info. Um, and again, this, all right. Snippets don't work great. I actually have to escape some backlash. There we go, okay. So now let's go into the main file, and the main file is literally just how we hook up things and go. So we give it a couple of flags in the beginning, we create our application, we create our server. And by the way, if you want to build an application in Go, this is all given to you. Like, you can import all these backing libraries, like the logger library or the server library, and just give it an application, and you're up and running like five minutes with your own application. Okay, there we go. Save this. So now let's uh, actually install this. And if you know Go, you might realize I've cheated slightly. I've downloaded the dependency beforehand um, because this would have otherwise taken like 15 minutes. All right, now we have the counter app. And this is our first application that runs on top of the tenement consensus engine. Now we want to start the tenement consensus engine. And for this, 
This time we just leave out the dash dash proxy app flag and rather just start it as such. Now Tenement is waiting for is waiting to connect to the application. And now we can start the application. And I will explain in a second what the application actually does. Ooh, that coding. Oh yeah. And um, so Tenement internally keeps some state. So I need to reset the Tenement instance. Okay. Now we have to initialize Tenement again. Kill this. Run Tenement node. And hope that this works. Yes, so now our application, and as you can see, it's like super easy. It's like 50 lines of code you have to write yourself to actually get started. If you have an idea, it's like five minutes, and your first application that you can deploy to hundreds of nodes around the world. And now I, can, I will show you what actually happens. Now someone can submit a transaction for a, towards Tenement. And Tenement will run this transaction through the consensus engine with, and gossip it to its peers and then update the application state, so the business logic. And now is maybe a good time to actually talk about what Tenement, um, what the application actually does. So all the application does, it keeps a counter. So you can submit a one, or you have to, you have to submit a zero first, and then you submit a one, and then you have to submit a three, uh, no, a two, and then a three. But if you submit like a 10, then the application doesn't work. So this is, it's a very simple application. It literally enforces that transactions or numbers are submitted in order. And the cool thing here is that we could be hundreds of users that are submitting transactions at the same time, and only one will ever succeed, and it's completely deterministic which one will succeed. So, well, actually, yeah, but, so you have this global consensus, this global ordering of transactions. So now we try to submit um, a five, but a five doesn't work, right? Because we've only submitted a zero and a one. Um, so, oh, a zero actually. So now let's try to submit one. And this now succeeds again. So we've updated the state again. And yeah, this was pretty much already the demo. The last call is just a simple example of um, what kind of information Tenement actually gives back to you. So you get um, how many blocks we've produced, and we roughly produce one block a second. So this has taken roughly two minutes to show. And with this demo, like this is a kind of stupid example, right? But it just shows you how easy it is to get started if you actually want to get started with Tenement. And with this, I can switch back to the presentation. And uh, no. thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Harry. Right. Okay, cool. If you have questions about the application, which I guess some of you might have, please post them to slide slide down. And I'll give you like a minute to do this, and then we'll continue afterwards. <laughs>